We all remember the 1999 comedy Life, right? You got Martin Lawrence playing opposite Eddie Murphy, two comedy giants who dominated the stage, television, and film. Eddie had the 80s. Then Martin came and pulled up and stole on the 90s. Fans of the two were desperate for another reteaming after Boomerang, and they finally got their wish. Life features a supporting cast of Bernie Mac, Miguel A. Nunez Jr., Anthony Anderson, Guy Torrey, Rick James, Bokeen Woodbine, and it continues on and on. The movie was packed with stars. Everyone's performances were so convincing that it had the feeling of a true story. In the film, Eddie and Martin play Ray Gibson and Claude Banks, two strangers who meet each other and end up getting wrongfully convicted of murder and get sentenced to life in prison. We love life for its authenticity. It's one of those movies that come off as a true story, you know? Like the ending even tells us what Ray and Claude are up to now, you know, keeping up with them. Life deals with issues that affect the world today, and it falls in line with Eddie's method of sliding in covert messages within his movies. Because the film dealt with the prison system and took place at the real-life Mississippi State Penitentiary, Parchment Farm, the accuracy of the Life movie had to be as authentic and spot-on as possible. The writers and producers did their job after researching the tough conditions of prison farms and several cases of wrongful imprisonment. This is what was true in the movie Life. Wrongful imprisonment, accurate. Wrongful imprisonment is the most prevalent topic in life and it's something that still happens to this day. A recent case being Ricky Jackson, who spent 39 years in prison for a crime he did not commit. 40 years. It's a long time for any crime, even murder. It's a hell of a lot longer when you're innocent. When Jackson was 18, he and a friend were arrested for killing a man, Harold Franks, outside a convenience store. Jackson and his friend swore they'd never seen Franks before, but a statement from a 12-year-old told police Jackson and his friend committed the crime. In 1975, Jackson was convicted of a murder and sentenced to die by an electric chair. Just two weeks later, the death sentence was reduced to life after Ohio's capital punishment law was deemed unconstitutional by the U.S. Supreme Court. Jackson was exonerated in 2014 after his original arrest in 1975. Stories of wrongful imprisonment happen way too often. John Bunn is another one who spent 17 years of his life in a maximum security prison and another 10 years on parole for a crime he didn't even commit. At the age of 14, police picked up Bunn because they thought he was involved in the killing of an off-duty Rikers Island corrections officer. At the trial, Bunn was sentenced to 20 years to life, but was later reduced to nine to life. Life? What do you mean life? Hell no, I ain't doing no life. I'm to myself. It's a mistrial. It's a mistrial. Hey, my son, I'm trying to get somebody life. I didn't even kill nobody, man. Police misconduct. Accurate. After 27 years, in 2015, a motion was filed on John Bunn's behalf by the Exoneration Initiative, where the judge declared that the evidence used to convict Bunn was paltry and claimed that the detective on the case, Detective Scarcella, had a disregard for rules, law, and the truth. Sound familiar? Bunn was a free man. As of 2018, 14 of Scarcella's cases from the 80s and 90s have been overturned due to tainted evidence, misleading testimony, or forced confessions. Unfortunately, Scarcella has never been charged for a crime and the statute of limitations has expired for any possible offenses and crimes that he's done. Scarcella remains in New York City collecting a pension. Life shows that some cops have no problem with letting others take the blame for the crimes that they didn't commit. And who could forget the exonerated five, where the five young men were falsely convicted of assaulting and raping a white female jogger. All of the falsely convicted served their sentences before they were exonerated after the confession came from another inmate. The five boys didn't have lawyers present during the questioning and none of their DNA matched the DNA from the crime scene, nor was there any physical evidence connected to the five teenagers, but they were prosecuted after police coerced confessions out of them. DNA, accurate. Life starts off in the year 1932. The only reason Ray and Claude were arrested is because they were still with the body. According to the information found on the Innocence Project's page, DNA testing was first used in a criminal trial in England in 1986. One could only hope that if DNA existed back then, evidence would have found that Ray and Claude was innocent. But the way the criminal justice system is set up and crooked cops and all that, you know how that works. <sighs> Wishful thinking. Prison farm, that's accurate. When Ray and Claude are sentenced to life in prison, they're sent to Camp 8 Parchment Farm, a real prison located in Mississippi. 
The writers and producers of Life had to do a ton of research on prison farms and work conditions to keep the accuracy. After being sentenced to life in prison, Ray and Claude get sent to a prison farm in Mississippi where they must perform hard labor for the rest of their lives. Work conditions, accurate. Inmates at the prison work on the prison farm and in manufacturing workshops. It holds prisoners at all security levels, minimum, medium, and maximum, as well as death row inmates. The conditions Ray, Claude, and other prisoners went through could be compared to the Southern convict leasing system that took place as early as 1846 and lasted to as late as 1949, although some sources vary. The convict leasing system is where the Southern states leased prisoners to private railways, mines, and other large plantations. States profited from the convict's work, but prisoners earned no pay and faced inhumane and dangerous work conditions. The environment was so brutal, it was often called slavery by another name. Inmates were required to pick 200 pounds of cotton per day, and the ones that fell short were beaten. The 13th Amendment prohibited slavery and involuntary servitude in 1865, but it didn't include those who were convicted of a crime. Race is a huge theme when it comes to the movie, Life. Towards the beginning of the film, when Ray and Claude are making their trip from New York to Mississippi, they stop at an all-white diner that doesn't allow blacks in. How much it gonna cost to turn one of them white-only pies into nigger pie? How about I turn y'all into nigger pie? From the treatment at the restaurant to the treatment of the prisoners on the prison farm, it's clear that the Southern convict system was a loophole where its purpose was to continue slavery in the South and let the Southern states keep on doing that stupid and the system used slavery as a punishment for a crime. Illiteracy, accurate. According to the State Penitentiary Report of 1917, blacks made up about 90% of the prison population. Most were illiterate serving long sentences for violent crimes. Which brings us back to the scene where Ray reads a letter that Poker Face had for four months. The letter was nothing but bad news. Anybody else got something they want read? Oh. <laughs> yeah, I can't blame y'all. Out of all the inmates, Sentences for murder made up 35%. At the time, 38% of black inmates got life sentences and 58% got 10 years or more. The look, accurate. According to the book that discusses the specific prison system, worse than slavery, the prison farm doesn't look like a prison at all, but instead a plantation with no walls, guard towers, or cell blocks. When Ray and Claude first get to the jail, Sergeant Dillard tells them that they don't need fences because we got a gun line, boss. Don't try to run, don't try to escape. One of my trustees will put a bullet in your head. Trustees, accurate. The trustees the sergeant was talking about were a real thing too. Trustees were prison inmates that were selected by officials because they were trustworthy and they made them into armed guards. They had a strong desire to please the white man above them and they were feared and hated by the black men below them. Think Uncle Ruckus or Sam Jackson's Steven and Django. Hop and Bob was a character in the Life movie who showed off in front of Master in order to keep his position. It's unclear if Hop and Bob was an official trustee on the prison farm, but he definitely fits the description. Uniforms, accurate. When prisoners showed up to the parchment farm, they were gifted with what they call ring arounds. Shirts and pants with horizontal black and white stripes, much like the ones you see in the film. That shit was ugly. According to Digital History, 10% of Alabama's total revenue came from convict leasing. In 1898, that number increased to an unbelievable 73%. Death rates among convicts were around 10 times higher than the death rates of prisoners in non-leased states. In 1873, approximately 25% of black leased convicts died. It wasn't long until the convict leasing system transformed into something else. Prisoners that worked for private companies and businesses eventually began working for the public sector, which led to the chain gang. Ooh, conjugal visit. Accurate, you nasty. In the film, during one of the family visits, Claude's fiance Daisy visits, and he bribes the sheriff to give him a temporary marriage license. Conjugal visits were common in the Mississippi State Penitentiary, as were bribes. According to the evolution of conjugal visiting in Mississippi, author Columbus B. Hopper said, the visits began as early as 1918. They were originally only available to black males because they thought black males were more promiscuous, you know, they thought we was nasty, than whites and had a stronger sex drive than the whites did. And authorities thought that if they were allowed to have intercourse, they'd be more productive when it came to their labor. These conjugal visits were created because they helped reduce homosexuality and sexual assaults in prison. However, just because they existed doesn't mean that there wasn't still some down low men in prison. Claude. Claude. Yeah, Claude. 
your hand nice and supple, like a lady. Prison to Major League Baseball, accurate. Believe it or not, the story can't get right with something that actually happened. Ronald LaFleur was sentenced to five to 15 years in prison after robbing a neighborhood bar with a rifle. Much like Can't Get Right, LaFleur's first experience with organized baseball was in prison. While there, LaFleur met Jimmy Corrala, a fellow inmate who saw his talent and got in touch with a friend who got in touch with another friend who got in touch with a friend that led with a meeting with the Detroit Tigers. LaFleur was released from prison in 1973 and immediately signed a contract with the Tigers where he played until 1979. Ray convinced a reluctant Claude to let Can't Get Right play baseball. Both were pleasantly surprised when they found out he had talent. They thought he was their ticket out of prison. They told the Negro League scout that they were Can't Get Right's handlers. They had to play nice if they wanted to get out too. All right, take care. Have a nice day. Okay. Yeah. Walked off smooth with my drink, didn't he? You sure did. Yeah, I ain't gonna say nothing though. Have a good day. We're going. Take care now. Enjoy, man. Can't Get Right was eventually pardoned and released from Camp 8. Unfortunately for Ray and Claude, the pardon didn't include them and they remained in jail. Escaping. Accurate. Throughout the film, Ray and Claude tried to escape prison numerous times. The first time they ran from Mississippi to Tallahassee before getting caught. And as punishment, they get sent to the hole. Years later, Ray makes an escape by himself by flying a plane, but he eventually crashed and burned and it was once again him back in the hole. In the film, the punishment for running away was being sent to the hole. Seems like a light sentence for trying to run away. Escaping Mississippi State Penitentiary is no easy task. In January 2020, correction officers discovered two men missing from Parchment during an emergency inmate count in the middle of the night, just like the real life film. The two made it all the way to Tennessee before being captured. Life is considered a comedy, but it does deal with some dark and serious issues that still affect us today. It's a fictional story that draws inspiration from many different real life incidents. While the movie is meant to make you laugh, Eddie made sure it featured his signature covert message. He talked about real things, but gave it to us in a digestible package. Through the movie, we got to take a look inside the convict leasing system and wrongful convictions, and we got to see what life lessons were true. In 1997, it's discovered that after living in the infirmary, Ray and Claude stole two bodies from the morgue, planted the bodies in their beds, started a fire, and hid in the fire trucks and left with them. Finally, finally, after 65 years of being wrongfully in prison, Ray and Claude had their freedom. Unfortunately, most people who are wrongfully convicted do not get the happy ending that Ray, Claude, Ricky Jackson, John Bunn, the Exonerated Five do not get. While these men knew they were innocent, one thing they never did was give up hope.